Okay, well, um, thanks again, Guchuan, for introducing me. And let me um, reiterate what Guchuan said about the problem sets. I think that if you really want to learn this stuff, you need to think it through for yourself a little bit. Um, it's, you know, especially these kind of computational uh, topics are really, really uh, uh, emphasized or really, really, uh, really e explained by by carrying out computations yourself. And that's, you know, that's the same way we treat our undergraduate students, right? We expect them to actually do the computations themselves, not just uh, watch the, watch their instructors do them. And that's the, it's really the same principle that's applying here. So even if you don't write up neat solutions and you know and all that, you at least take a look at the problem. Take a look at the problems, think them through for yourself. Just you know, even if it's just kind of scratch work, I think it um, it's a really valuable, uh, a re really valuable experience in in uh, solidifying all this material. Okay, so the topic that I'm going to discuss today is Massey products. Okay, and we will uh, and I'll as we go, I'll kind of explain. We'll start off explaining what they are, and as we go, we'll expl I'll explain a little bit about how they're useful for um, computing stable homotopy groups. Hey, but there's sort of an interesting uh, kind of subject just in, in and of itself, okay? So here's the situation. Situation is that A is some differential graded algebra, okay? The, what you should have in mind here is something that is not commutative, okay? Typically, these kinds of in interesting differential graded algebras that arise in stable homotopy theory are not. Okay, so uh, what is a differential graded algebra? Well, it's a graded, uh, it's a graded vector space. It has a ring structure, graded ring structure. It also has a differential, okay? And that differential satisfies the Leibniz rule. That's the key formula in, uh, in you know, of a differential graded algebra. Notice I'm just writing plus here. There's no plus or minus. It's, we're working mod two. Yet on Tuesday, we were working mod two. Today, we're working mod two. One of the big advantages of working mod two is I don't have to worry about all the annoying minus signs that come into play when you're working at uh, that odd price. Okay, so there's there's my Leibniz rule. Okay, and a good example, maybe the maybe the most important example from my perspective of of a differential graded algebra is the Cobar complex. Okay, the Cobar complex is a very specific. Uh, differential graded algebra that you construct out of the dual Stern algebra. You start with the dual Stern algebra, you do something to you take it like a tensor algebra sort of over the dual Stern algebra, something like that, and you get the Cobar complex. And we're not going to get into the Cobar complex in any detail in this in this mini course, but it, there's a thing, and a very explicit thing, and its homology is the X over over the steamer algebra F2 comma F2. In other words, it's the Adam Z2 page, okay? So one way of computing the Adam Z2 page is to take this, this Cobar complex, which is not a commuted, a non-commuted differ differential graded algebra and take its homology, okay? That's, in, that's, that's a nice simple formula, except in practice, it's really hard to compute with the, the Cobar complex, okay? So that's why we don't sort of, we don't have, we don't know everything that we'd like to know about this thing because it's actually a hard algebraic problem. Okay. Another example that's worth keeping in mind is take the ER page of, I, mean, I wrote the May spectral sequence here, which we haven't talked about, although we will talk about it later. So, um, so uh, but if you have a multiplicative spectral sequence, like the May spectral sequence, or like the Adams spectral sequence, then the differential, the DR differential on an ER page. So for just look at ER, forget E2, forget E3, just take ER itself. ER is an algebra and ER has a differential on it, has the DR differential. And that DR differential satisfies a Leibniz rule because the spectral sequence is multiplicative. That's what it means to be a multiplicative spectral sequence. Okay? So you have an ER, it's an algebra, you have a DR, it's a differential. And the homology, the thing that you study the homology, that's ER plus one. Okay, so the ER, uh, so the ER page of the May spectral sequence with equipped with the DR differential is a differential graded algebra, and it's an important one that that, that comes up and need to be, that you need to compute with. And the same thing is true for the Adam spectral sequence. Okay, and really any multiplicative spectral sequence will uh, will 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 give you the ER page of any multiplicative spectral sequence will be an example of this. Okay, so. What happens to a differential graded algebra is, of course, you want to compute its homology. That's why we're studying the differential graded algebra in the first place. And the homology of a differential graded algebra automatically inherits a product structure. What happens is you have to check that it's well-defined in the usual way. When you mod out by the boundaries, you have to make sure 
that, uh, that, that the product is still well-defined. And it is well-defined precisely because of the Leibniz rule. Okay, the Leibniz rule is just getting, you've got to go through and check it. This is sort of like, you know, an, um, uh, an undergraduate math major abstract algebra exercise, roughly, you know, to speaking, speaking to check it, but you do that and that's what happens. Okay, so H of A is a ring again, as is an algebra again. Okay, but actually H of A has a lot more structure than just being of just than just this primary product. It does have a primary product, but there's a lot more to, to it. There's some deeper structure. And that's what massy products are. Okay. So let's let's talk about what that is in detail. Okay, so let's start by taking three cycles. A01, A12, and A23. Okay, these, these are three cycles in A. Okay, what does it mean to be a cycle? It means that the bound that that the differential is zero, right? Or in other words, that it is that so then since they're cycles then they represent elements in homology okay and so then we'll write a bar zero one a bar one two a bar two three for the uh for the corresponding classes in the homology that they represent and so there's a difference between the cycles themselves in a and the the, uh, the homology classes that they that they represent now um I'm using maybe, you might be wondering about this notation here. Why am I make, using such complicated subscripts on these elements? Why not just call this one A0, this one A1, and this one A2? Well, there's a specific reason that I'm doing that. And maybe I'll explain it as we're going to get used to it. And I'll explain a little bit later about where exactly that, um, that, that, that choice of notation comes from. OK? All right, so there's three cycles. And these three cycles need to satisfy a condition. The condition is that in homology, the pairwise, two of the pairwise products are zero. Okay? A zero one bar times a one two bar is zero and a one two bar times a two three bar is zero. Okay? And what that means is if you go back to A, that the product in A, they're not zero, but they're boundaries, right? They, they are, um, they equal differentials on something else, right? They are boundaries, that's what it means, okay? So what happens, and here's kind of like the philosophy of the Massey product, is that this triple product is zero for two different reasons. One reason that it's zero is that the first two are zero, and then when you multiply by the third one, it's still zero. A different reason is that the last two multiply to zero, and then when you put the first one in the front, it's still zero. Okay? And this is kind of a, this is an overarching principle, not just of stable homotopy group computations, or even of stable homotopy theory, but of homotopy theory in sort of like the broadest possible sense, that whenever you have that something, you have two different reasons for something being zero, what you should do is look at the difference between those two reasons, and that's a higher dimensional invariant in the situation that you're studying. That's, that's, that comes up again and again and again throughout all of, of, of homotopy theory. Okay, so. Here, so let's explore this idea of the two different reasons. What exactly do I mean? Well, you can, since A01, A12 is a boundary, that means you can choose an A02 that hits it. And similarly, since there's a, since, since A12, A23 is a boundary, you can choose an A13 that hits it, okay? You can make those choices, okay? And I really wanna emphasize choose here. Notice that you have to make some choices, okay? Then, Oh, you know what? There's a mistake here. Okay, so then you're ready to define the Massey product. The Massey product of a zero one bar comma a one two bar comma a two three bar is the uh, you take a zero two, you take this choice a zero two, and you multiply it by a two three, and then you take a zero one and you multiply it by a one three. Okay, so this formula maybe looks confusing and arbitrary, but let me show you again, go back to this idea of the two different reasons. What is A02 times A23? It's the reason this is zero times that third term. And what is A01, A13? It's A01 times the reason that the second two are zero. Okay, so it really is sort of taking, and remember plus is minus since we're working mod two. So it really does look like the difference between the two reasons that this triple product is zero. Okay, so you have to check that this, ex this expression inside is a cycle. 
Okay, and that just comes right out of these formulas. And so then you can take the homology classes that these cycles represent. Okay, now I've put braces around this expression because it's a set of elements. It's the set of all possible elements where you consider all possible choices of A0 to A13. A0 to and A13 were chosen to have um, the, the correct sort of values of their differentials, but that doesn't specify A0 to and A13 exactly on the nose. It, it, only, specifies, it, only, um, it only specifies them up to a cycle. If you have an A0, if you've chosen an A02, with the correct you know, value of D, D of A02 is the correct value, you could add a cycle to A02 and you'd have another element with the same differential on it. Okay, so there's a choice of A02 and there's a choice of A13, okay? And you have to account for that. So the result is that this, this Massey product is not an element, it's actually a coset in H of A, okay? And by when I, when I mean a coset, I mean with respect to some subgroup. Okay, so there's some additive subgroup of H of A, and then the uh, and then there's um, uh, and then this thing is it's not just any old set; it's sort of affine. It's, it's yeah, this is a it's a cosine. It's got that linear kind of somewhat linear structure. Okay, and if you go through carefully and you look at how the choices affect things, see right in here, if you change a zero two by a cycle, then what you're going to then this whole expression is going to change by a cycle times a two three. And that's what I've written here. Okay? And if you change A13 by a cycle, then your whole expression is going to change by A01 times a cycle. And that's what I've got here. Okay. So within this coset, there's a subgroup, right? There's an element and a subgroup, right? And that subgroup is, is exactly this. It's the, um, it's, the, it's the right multiples of A01 bar um, and the left multiples of A2 of, of A23 bar. And I'm keeping the order, I've been very careful with the order here throughout, because remember, we're working in a non-commutative context where we will certainly want our DG, our differential graded algebra to be non-commutative. And so the order in which we write things could potentially matter. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of details here. Let's look at some concrete examples, okay? Or a concrete example. Okay, so here it is. Okay, so the example that I'm going to talk about is the uh, the algebra is a polynomial algebra on six generators. Okay, this example happens to be commutative. This is a commutative polynomial algebra. Okay, so in in um, from a certain perspective, this is sort of not a typical DGA, but it's but it, it, it's good for our purposes to work with. Okay, and here I've written some formulas for the differentials. Okay, and that um, these formulas can be hard. All these elements and all these formulas can be hard to keep track of. So there's a really nice way of organizing all this this information in this example, and that's over here in this triangle. Okay, I've written this triangle. This triangle consists of the the six generators. Okay, and when you put them this way, you can start to see patterns and kind of see how they fit together. Okay, and I've also arranged them in such a way that you can read the differentials off of this little chart here as well. The differential of H02 is the product of the things that are above it. And the differential on H13 is the product of the things that are above it. Compare these formulas over here. Okay. And the differential on H03 is a certain kind of linear combination of these elements that kind of, you know, that you take kind of like you, this, this V that's kind of got, got, got H03 as the vertex. And you, but you gotta have to, you take this one times this one, and then this one times this one. So you sort of work your way, you work your way down one diagonal and you work your way up the other diagonal and you take these two things multiplied together and these two things multiplied together. Okay, and there's a sort of a pattern there. And that's exactly what I've, uh, I've written here. Okay, so if you're trying to sort of wrap your head around this and you want to kind of remember this example later, don't, what I'm trying to say is don't memorize these formulas. What you should memorize is this picture together with this rule about differentials being, uh, being indexed by the sort of the elements up, uh, up above that, that particular element. Okay, so what happens when you want to, let's say we want to compute, uh, so, so now this A, this is a differential graded algebra and it has some homology, okay? H of A is something, okay? And in that H of A, 
I want to compute this massy product, this H01 bar, H12 bar, H23 bar. Okay, the pairwise products are in fact zero in homology because of these differentials. Okay, so what's the reason? The choice of A02 up here, right? We need to, we need to choose A02 and, and A13. Okay, and so um, hang on a second. Oh, yeah. Um, da, da, da. Right, so in this example, right. So the question is, um, what about, you know, I've only listed off three elements, the differentials for three elements, where are the other elements? And the answer is, yeah, they're zero, okay? Differential on H01 is zero, the differential on H12 is zero, and the differential on H23 is zero, okay? And if you have a monomial, then what, um, what, you, what you, you, you can extend it, but the Leibniz rule, okay? So if I tell you what all of the generators do, then you know how to extend it. Just use, use, use the Leibniz rule on higher powers and so forth. Okay, so um, I need to choose an A02, and in this case, it's exactly H02. That's the thing whose differential is H01 times H12. I need to choose an A13, and that in this example is exactly H13. Okay, and then I need to write down this, um, this expression here, and that's exactly what I've got there. Okay, so this is, uh, and uh, this is the Massey product that we're interested in, okay? But, and, and if I didn't have this H03, in fact, for a second, let's just kind of ignore this. Let's say, what if we didn't have that sixth generator? What if we only had these first five generators? If we only had these first five generators, then this would be a, a non-zero cycle in the homology and we'd be all done and we have computed this Massey product. However, what happens here is that there, oops, I wrote, and there's another typo here. Sorry about that. This should be H03. Okay, it, there is another element, there is an H03, and its job is precisely to kill this thing off, right? So this expression in, under the bar is actually a boundary, which means that it's actually zero, okay? So what have we done here? We wrote down this little example, and we computed the Massey product carefully, and we got zero, okay? So that's kind of boring, right? When you compute things and you get zero, it would be, you might be thinking, well, it might be more interesting to have a non-zero example. And you're right, it would be. And, but but this, this example also, as I said, contains a non-zero example. Just throw out this fifth generator and then you'll have a non-zero example, okay? But, um, but there is a reason that I chose this particular example to study. And that's what's written at the bottom of the screen, that this particular example, this particular A is precisely the E1 page of the May spectral sequence, okay? And not that it converges to the cohomology of the Steward algebra, it converges to the cohomology of A of two, okay? So this, uh, in other words, this is the May spectral sequence that computes the Adams E2 page for little TMF, okay? So this isn't just any old DGA that I wrote down just as an example. This is a really important DGA. It's the May spectral sequence that's where the starting point for the computation of the homotopy of TMF, if, at least if you're doing it with the atom spectral sequence. There's other ways of computing the homotopy of TMF, say with the atoms Novikov, that you might not do this way. But if with atoms, this is the starting point. This DGA is the starting point. Okay. All right. So this is the scope kind of the discussion about what we've been talking about so far are threefold Massey products. Okay? The homology of any DGA has these threefold Massey products. Uh, you know, I didn't say this, but let me go back and let me I want to emphasize sort of two kind of important conceptual points about Massey products, which can be kind of a stumbling block to people when they're getting used to working with them and there's can be a little bit intimidating. Uh, first of all, you know, it's a triple product. It takes, it's like a, a ternary operation. It takes three inputs and gives you an output. But from that perspective of it being a ternary operation, there's really two weaknesses. First of all, it's not defined for all triples. A Massey product is only defined when you have the pairwise products are zero. That's, so it's not defined everywhere. And perhaps even psychologically even worse than that, it's not even well-defined, right? The value of a massive product is not an element of the thing you started with. It's a coset inside of the thing you started with. So it's got, it's got problems both with respect to the source and with respect to the target. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's just something you have to learn to live with. I know from experience, you, you can train yourself to deal with it, right? It is a complication that you always have to keep track of indeterminacies, 
but you can, uh, but, but it, it's manageable in general. Okay. All right, so there are higher generalizations of these massive products. And I don't wanna go into too much detail about this, but I just maybe touch a little bit on these fourfold massive products because they're gonna come up later in some of the examples that we wanna look at, okay? If you have, you wanted to, to study a fourfold massive product, a01 bar comma a12 bar comma a23 bar comma a34 bar, then what you need is that you need all of the pairwise adjacent products to be zero. So these two multiply to zero, these two multiply to zero, and these two multiply to zero. But you also need that the two sub brackets, there are two threefold sub brackets here, and you need zero to be contained in both of them. I didn't say that zero equals them because remember these are cosets. I need zero contained in them. And actually there's one more kind of technical compatibility condition in order to make this well-defined. This is actually not quite enough to make it well-defined, but I don't wanna get into that. It won't, it won't come up at all in the mini course. And so I don't, I wanna ignore it. Um, but this is, you need all of the sub brackets, the two fold brackets, which are just products need to be vanished. The three fold brackets need to vanish and so forth. And then you can choose an A02 that hits that product. You can choose an A13 that hits that product. You can choose an A24 that hits that product. But then because the first, because this threefold bracket vanishes, what that means is that this expression, this A01 times A13 plus A02 times A23, that's a boundary. That's what it means. That, that is the threefold bracket and that's a boundary. So you can choose an A03 that hits A01 times A13 plus A02 times A23. And similarly, because this bracket is assumed to vanish, that means that A12 times A24 plus A13 times A34 uh, is a boundary. And so you can choose an A14 that hits it, okay? So you have to make these five choices, okay? And then what you do is you consider all expressions of this form for all possible choices. There are five choices that you have to make here. You consider all possible choices for all five of these and you end up with a subset here, okay? So, um, and again, what's the pattern here in this formula? You can look at all the subscripts and, and maybe it's confusing, but um, you sort of, you work your way, you work your way down this diagonal and you work your way up this diagonal simultaneously. So you've got this times this plus this times this plus this times this, okay? So again, down one side, up the other, and you get these three expressions, okay? Um, so, and you can start to see here now why this kind of weird choice of notation that I made is actually kind of useful. See, look at um, what are all of these subscripts here? Well, they all start, they are all of the form A0 and then a number, and then A, the same number, and then a four, right? So each of these, it starts with a zero and it ends with a four. And then there's another number that's duplicated. It's A01, A14, A02, A24, A03, A34, okay? And this ends up being, you know, well, all right, let me, let me put that in this still. I, I, I'm gonna say a little bit more about the notation, but you can already start to see that actually it seems really arbitrary at the beginning. And as you get into the comp computations, it's starting to, to, uh, to make it a little easier to work with, okay? You can, um, you can study higher brackets, five-fold brackets, six-fold brackets. Um, I, they, you know, as the, as the number of in inputs goes up, they become harder and harder to work with. They're more and more obscure. They're, they're sort of, you know, deeper and deeper and maybe less and less, you know, um, common. I have used a fivefold Massey product to, you know, do some explicit computation at some point that I think in the cohomology this year in algebra. Uh, I, but that was like a very rare, very kind of difficult situation. I, you know, I, I commonly work with threefold brackets. I use fourfold brackets regularly, although I try to avoid them if I can because they're they're complicated. But three and threefold brackets and fourfold brackets are, are things that get used. You go look in the literature, you know, about stable homotopy group computations, you'll see threefold brackets and fourfold brackets throughout. Uh, beyond that, like 
it's it's not really a thing. As I say, like once I use a fivefold bracket to do something, but it's not really uh, any anything that occurs in, in in practice. So knowing about the threefold one and the fourfold ones is is good enough sort of practical knowledge, I think. Okay, but you can write down a formula, and it involves. You see, again, you have these expressions where it's you know a starts at zero, it ends at n, and then there's the that second number repeated a zero one a one n a zero two a two n a zero three a three n and so forth. Okay. All right. So the May E1 page for the full Steiner algebra. Earlier we talked about the May E1 page for the cohomology of A of two, but now I'm talking about the May E1 page that computes the cohomology of the Steiner algebra that computes the the Adams E2 page, the usual Adams E2 page. Okay. So here's what it is. You have a bunch of HIJs. Okay, indexed by pairs where, uh, where I is a positive integer and J is a bigger integer, okay? I said positive, but I guess I mean a non-negative, right? I is non-negative and then J is bigger than I, okay? And the differential has this nice formula. And again, you're seeing that, you know, they all start with the differential in HIJ, all these expressions, the subscripts start with I, the subscripts end with J, and then you index over the k's, you double that k for the k's that are strictly between i and j. So this is a nice kind of clean formula. And that's why, and it's the cleanliness of this, of this formula here in this description, which is the reason that I chose this kind of funny note, somewhat non-standard notation. Okay, well, when it comes to non-standard notation, that's, I'm not really, really even sure what that means. It seems that every author that has studied the uh, the written about the May spectral sequence in detail has chosen a different notation. Okay, the notation that I'm talking about here today is not the same notation that I have used in my own writing. Okay, I decided for these talks that I was going to adopt a different notation because I have a feeling, my instinct tells me that this notation that we're using here today is actually the best notation, is actually the most convenient notation for extensive computations anyway, okay? And this notation comes out of Peter May's article, Matrix Massey Products. If you're interested in reading more about Massey Products, I highly recommend that paper. It is, you know, it is technical, and, but you know, go through that paper, read it line by line, work, all, work out all the proofs for yourself, do the computations, and I think you'll learn something about Massey products. And Peter May uses this kind of this double notation here that I'm talking about. And I, my, my instinct is that it really is the most convenient. I think it's well-chosen notation and, and it really works well. And so I, this, this mini course was sort of, um, was an opportunity for me to kind of try out this notation. And, you know, it's, a little, it's pretty good. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like I, I, I you know, I've, uh, I, I'm pretty happy with it. And going forward, I, you know, I may or may not write my papers using this notation. I don't know. I haven't decided about that yet. But, but I like this notation. So, um, so, just like with the one for a of two, there is an, there is a triangle, triangular arrangement of these guys that really kind of helps you keep track of them. You can try to memorize these formulas, and that's fine. But really what's a more conceptual, better way of understanding what's going on is to look at this infinite triangle. And as we've had before, the differential of, of these guys on the second row are the products that are sitting above them. On the, on the lower rows, say, uh, for example, this one, you could, if you're looking for the differential in H05, you would work your way down this diagonal and up this diagonal, and you'd take these products, H01 times H15, H02 times H25, H03 times H35, H04 times H45. <coughs> okay, that's the differential in H05. Okay, so this thing goes forever; it's infinite. Okay, and so uh, and and that this is really the you know if you're going to sort of look at the May E1 page globally, I think that this triangular picture is really the, the the way to do it. Okay, now notice that the formulas that we're talking about here for the differentials on the HIJ are exactly the same formulas that you use when you are computing a higher Massey product. Okay? And so there's a slogan here that I've written at the bottom. Okay? And this is not, and I've used the word slogan to mean that it's not meant to be necessarily 
um, a precise statement, although maybe one could, could make it precise, that this May E1 page is, I would call it the universal infinite massy product that contains zero. So what do I mean here? I mean, along the top row, there are infinitely many elements, okay? And all in homology, all of the pairwise making this five-fold bracket here is making it zero, okay? And the six-fold and the seven-fold, and it goes on forever, right? That's sort of of, of arbitrarily long length. You know, it, it's not quite infinite. It's more like, you know, um, finite, but arbitrarily large finite or something like that. It's more like the universal arbitrarily large finite massy product that contains zero or some, something like that, okay? So um, that's an interesting perspective. And I don't quite understand you know, what this has to do with stable homotopy groups, right? It's sort of a, it's sort of an interesting observation that this, this universal infinite zero massy product is the starting point, the E1 page, the May E1 point is the starting point for all these later computations of stable homotopy groups. Um, I don't really know why it should start here, but, but it does. And that, that's probably, it, it's probably important for some reason or other. Okay. Oh, okay. So one other thing, Thing about this notation here. Uh, these guys along the top, they are usually just called H0, H1, H2, H3, H4. If you look at an Adams chart, you, you know, or you hear people talking about Adams charts, you hear them talking about H0, H1, H2, H3, and it's these guys along the top. Okay. I've used this different notation, this more cumbersome notation. Instead of having H0, H1, H2, instead of having just a single subscript, I now have to write two subscripts. Uh, and it's a little more cumbersome that way, but it, again, you know, it, it actually kind of does work pretty well. Uh, if you're, if you are familiar with the, the usual traditional HI notation, then with these H01, H12, just ignore the second subscript. H01 is H0, H12 is H1, H23 is H2, and so forth. Just look at that first subscript, and that'll align with the notation that maybe you're more familiar with. Okay. Now. It turns out there's sort of an algebra or, or, you know, of massy products. There are a bunch of relations that massy products satisfy. Okay? And these are sort of essentially for formal reasons. It's just the fact that you had a DGA to begin with, with, uh, with the differential that satisfies the Leibniz rule, these, these things come out, okay? So one general formula is that a massy product contains zero if any of the three inputs are zero. You know, I kind of realized that there's a little bit of change of notation between this slide and the previous slide. I don't think I want to change this notation, the slide, because it will clutter it up. But, you know, up earlier, when I wrote things like A01, what I meant was an element of A, and then I would write A01 bar for the element of the homology, okay? Um, what I'm writing now is just elements in homology. When I'm writing A01, A12, A23 bar, A A23 here, I'm thinking of them as already being in homology. Okay, so that so I could put bars over every single sort of a on this page, or I could have used a different letter. But uh, but the, so 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 the a's here are not quite in alignment with the a's that we looked at that earlier, although not that different either. Okay, if any of the three inputs are zero, then the massy product contains zero. These next three are a kind of linearity with respect to each of the three brackets. So when you have a sum in the first variable, you can split it up into two separate brackets. But there are two important warnings here. First of all, I am writing these formulas. I am assuming that all brackets are defined. So if all three of these brackets are defined, then this bracket on the left is contained in the linear span of the two brackets on the right. So, so, so that, that, that's one warning. The other warning is this inclusion, okay? What happens is that the indeterminacy on the right side can get bigger. The coset uh, can be bigger on the right than on the left. And it might be that this is actually only sitting inside. So you might, want, you might call this sublinearity or something like that for, for that reason, because of that possible inclusion. 
Okay, and this business about them not being defined, you see what could happen is that, that A01 plus A01 prime times A12 could be zero, but it might be that A01, A12 is non-zero and A01 prime times A12 is also non-zero. They'd have to be equal, right? These could be non-zero and equal, and then that would make this zero. So it could be that this is defined even though those are not defined. And that's what I mean that you have to assume that all the brackets are defined in order to care of these formulas, okay? So there's um, a sublinearity in the, in, the, in the first variable. There's um, sublinearity in the third variable. Sublinearity in the second variable also holds, although this one's a little better, this one's actually an equality because the indeterminacy doesn't change, okay? And so that one's actually an equal sign. All right, and then there's sort of, then, then there are a couple of results. I guess all of these are sort of how the massy products interact with the primary product structure, okay? So this formula here has a massy product in it, but it also has a twofold product, A01 times the massy product, okay? And what happens is that you can take that that, that, uh, that, that coefficient, that element that's out in front of the massy product, and you can bring it inside. But again, the indeterminacy could increase, and so it may not be actually equal. Same thing on the left, if you, on the right, if you have a, um, a term on the right, you can bring it inside, but perhaps increase the indeterminacy. Okay? If you have a product in the first factor, you can bring one of those terms in here. You can kind of shift this, this A12 shifts, this A12 factor shifts from the, the first entry to the second entry. That's what happens between here and here. And the same thing between the third and the second variable, you can shift things in, inwards and, in, per, per, and perhaps increase. Okay, so um, if, you, uh, if, you're, you, if you're interested in massive products, then one thing you can do is go through all of these and check them by hand. Okay, just write out what they mean, just write up the definitions and verify that these formulas are all satisfied one at a time. I did that at one point when I was first learning about massy products. You know, I filled up several pages of scratch paper doing it and it was a fantastic exercise. I learned how massy products work by doing it for myself. Okay, so the idea is that when you have these kinds of, of um, inclusions, what you can do is uh, show that there is an element on the left that is that is contained in the in, in this expression on the right, and then sort of verify the indeterminacies. There's sort of two steps you have to do. You have to look at individual elements, and you also have to kind of compare indeterminacies. Okay, that's the two things that you have to uh, that, that you have to do typically as you um, as you work your way through these things. Okay, and then there's a third. One. There's a last one that I wrote it in color because this is the one that's most important. By, and what I and when I why I say the reason that I say it's most important is that I've done a lot of computations with Massey products and time and again this is the most powerful one this is the most useful one the others do occur but less frequently and less interestingly this last one is really an interesting result okay and one of the exercises is to work this out verify that this is in fact true so you've got four inputs a zero one a one two a two three a three four if you bracket the last three and then multiply by the first one, that's the same as bracketing the first three and multiplying by the last one. So uh, the way I look at this is I got the four elements there and what I'm really moving, I'm moving the braces, I'm moving the brackets, I'm shifting the brackets um, over to the left to go from here to here, or I'm shifting the brackets back um, to the right to go the other way. Okay, so you, um, you ought to be wondering at this point, if this is some sort of complete list of the, the relations that, that Massey products satisfy. I guess I don't actually know. I'm not even exactly sure what that means. I, it's probably complete for threefold Massey products. It's probably, this is probably the complete list of relations, whatever that means, or generating, you know, generates all relations or something like that. That's, that, that, that's my guess. Um, however, uh, it's definitely what happens in for higher brackets. There are these similar relations and more complicated ones involving fourfold brackets and threefold ones that sit inside. All kinds. There's crazy things, and we don't. Have, we know some relations between threefold brackets and fourfold brackets, but we don't even have a complete list of relations, even for fourfold brackets. We don't even really know all of the formulas they're supposed to satisfy. 
Okay, and for higher brackets, out of the question. Okay, so uh, uh, even for fourfold brackets, I think there's actually some work to be done on kind of foundational work to be done on the calculus of of, of messy products here in finding these kinds of relations. Okay. All right. So what we're really interested in are Massey products in X. Okay. So remember that the cohomology of the Stirling algebra X over A of F2 comma F2, it's the E2 page of the Adam spectral sequence. So we're really interested in that particular uh, that particular object, and it is. The homology of the Cobar complex, X over A, is the homology of a DGA, and that means it has Massey products. Okay? And the Massey product structure of the cohomology of A is really useful for deducing the structure of the cohomology of A. Okay? The problem is that the computations in the Cobar complex are difficult, even in low dimensions even in very low dimensions, like dimension zero and one and two and three, it's pretty lengthy. Carrying out Cobar complex uh, computations can be done, but it's pretty lengthy, okay? If you, no one ever wants to compute in the Cobar complex. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you think you need to look in the Cobar complex, it's probably because you haven't filtered enough. You filter the object more and you use a spectral sequence and you get rid of those comp higher order complications and you can work without it. Okay, so I never want to touch the Cobar complex. All right, so how do you compute uh, compute Massey products in X? If you don't look at the, at the Cobar complex, how would you do it? Well, there are a couple of ways. Okay, so first of all, there is a theorem of atoms that says that if you are interested in particular in a particular type of Massey product where you have an HN n plus one, and remember that traditionally that might just be called HN. Okay, so maybe I'll write that one. Okay, if you looking for a Massey product of the form HN n plus one comma X comma HN n plus one n comma n plus one again, and notice that the first and the third entries are identical. That's important. It's not just two of the H's, it's HN plus N N plus one and HN N plus one again. If you wanna compute that particular kind of Massey product, turns out that it always contains HN plus one N plus two times X, okay? So this is a formula for, um, of, of atoms for these particular, for Massey products of this particular type. Okay, I think, I, I guess I don't act exactly know the, uh, what proof that Adams wrote down. He probably did have to do some Cobar complex computations uh, in order to actually do, and actually, in order to actually get this. So when I say you never wanna do the Cobar complex, well, I guess maybe you have to do a little bit to get started or something like that. Okay, so there are lots of examples of these types of Massey products in of, of this sort of Adams type Massey products in low dimensions, for example, you could take H12 squared equals H01 comma H12 comma H01. And I know it looks weird when I'm writing this way. What I'm saying here is that H1 squared equals H0 comma H1 comma H0. So again, ignore, if you want to ignore the second, uh, the, the, the second uh, subscripts on all these elements and then it'll be put it into slightly more traditional notation. That might be, uh, if you already know your way around the the uh, the cohomology the standard algebra that might help you okay so h one squared is this sort of thing why that's just atoms just apply atoms to this to this to this exact to this bracket um, apply uh, what else do I have I have h two h two three squared is h one two comma h two three comma h one two again it's just applying atoms h uh, zero one times h two three is h one two h zero one h one h two same thing for h one two h three four Okay, so there's these different, and these are all in low dimensions. This is in the this is in the two stem, uh, this is in the three stem, this is in the six stem, this is in the uh, eight stem. Okay, so these are all real low dimensional things. Okay, all right. So what you can do, so but now you know I don't actually use the Cobar complex to compute x over a. I like to compute. Uh, I like to compute uh, with the May spectral sequence, okay? And hang on a second, before we get into the May spectral sequence, there's another question. 
do mean is an element of, or is there some low indeterminacy in these examples? That is a great question. So the question is, what about the indeterminacy? I wrote that these elements equal these massy products. And the question is, well, slow down, slow down. You just told us that it's a coset. What's going on with the indeterminacy? It turns out that in all four of these particular examples, the indeterminacy happens to be zero. Okay, there's no reason that we need that that we know that a priori we have to look at a chart or do the computation and see whether or not there's any products in that particular by degree that would make uh, that would make for a non-zero indeterminacy. Okay, they are zero. Uh, the term and so when I when I write that h1 squared equals uh, h0 comma h1 comma h0, what I really you know it's really shorthand for this singleton set equals h0, h1, h0, okay? The indeterminacy is zero, and so it turns out to be a singleton set, okay? And that happens often, uh, many, many times, the massive product that you're interested in, you're studying is a singleton, and there's no indeterminacy, and that's generally speaking good news. Uh, but it, it also happens that the indeterminacies are non-zero. So the instinct to immediately ask about indeterminacy is absolutely correct. You should always do that as you're working through a, a computation, you should be keeping track of the indeterminacies as you go. Otherwise you're gonna get hopelessly lost uh, sooner or later. Okay, so um, I use a spectral sequence, the May spectral sequence in order to compute the homology of the uh, um, of the Kovar complex in order to compute X over A, the cohomology of the student algebra. All right, and I'm not gonna go into detail about exactly how to construct this May spectral sequence. I've already told you what the May E1 page is, okay? And you should re be remembering this, this triangle. That's what the May E1 page of that spectral sequence looks like, okay? Maybe I'll just say a few words out loud to convince you that the thing exists. So you take the Cobar complex. The Cobar complex is a DGA. It's really complicated. It's not commutative. If you filter the DGA in a certain way, and then the associated graded comes out to be the May E1 page. Okay? And whenever you filter a differential graded algebra, you all you get automatically get a spectral sequence that computes the homology of the differential graded algebra. So that's what that's what May did. May chose a particular filtration on the Cobar complex, and he studied it, the spectral sequence associated to that, um, to that, to that filtration. Okay. So there's a really nice interplay between Massey products and May differentials. If you want to compute the May spectral sequence, well, then you have to compute May, the differentials in the May spectral sequence, and you can use Massey products to deduce May differentials, and. What's really interesting here and really powerful is that you can also use, if you know some May differentials, then you can use those May differentials to compute Massey products, okay? And that's what we've done in the first part of this talk is we have been talking a lot about how you, how if you, you, know, you use the differentials to compute the Massey products. You need to know the differentials in order to, to explicitly compute Massey products. So the second part is more familiar to us Okay, but it's the first part that's also powerful. So it's this back and forth, it's the interplay between these two, um, the, the, these two structures that's really powerful okay? and allows you to go, uh, allows you to carry the computations a long way. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this, how to do this. Um, and here you can uh, look at that picture while I'm talking. So there's um, the May convergence theorem, which is in May's matrix Massey products paper. Okay, and so let's suppose um, that you that you study, you know, you, you have this May ER page, okay, and it has a differential, it has a dr, okay, and therefore H of ER, the homology of ER, which is also ER plus one, it has Massey products. It's the homology of a DGA. The DGA is ER. Okay. If you compute a Massey product, I've got some element, maybe I shouldn't have used D because D is for differential, but if D is an element of A comma B comma C, suppose you have some Massey product that you've computed in this H of ER using the fact that ER is a DGA. Okay. Then that implies that there is a corresponding Massey product in X in the target of the spectral sequence. Okay. There are some technical conditions. That has to that, that need to be satisfied in order for you to 
get this implication. Okay. In all the examples that we're going to talk about, they're always satisfied, but they aren't always satisfied. There certainly are places where things are where things get complicated, and you might think that there's a, um, a, a massive product in X that turned out to not be a massive product in X because this implication breaks down because of these technical conditions. I don't wanna get into the technical conditions are interesting, but I don't wanna get into that. We don't really have time in this mini course to get into that. So we're just gonna kind of assume that everything is well-behaved and, um, and, and that's what happens in the examples that I'll talk about and in the exercises and so forth. We don't need to worry about that technical condition. Okay, all right. So here's an example of a massive product a fourfold massy product in X. Okay, this is a well-defined massy product in X. Okay, is H12 squared, comma H01, comma H12, comma H23. And again, if you're thinking more traditionally, H1 squared, H0, H1, H2. Okay, so uh, you have these four elements. You want to compute their. Um, you you could use the May D1 differential. Okay, in other words, I'm thinking about a a, a bracket in H of E1, okay? So the D1 differential, here's the cycle, H12, H02, that's the, not cycle, that's the element whose boundary is the product of the two things above it. H02, its differential is the product above it. H13 is the, is the product above it, okay? So you got this second, these second level guys. Now, this guy is supposed to be something that hits this product plus this product. But when you look at those two expressions, they're the same, okay? And so zero, so, so, you, so you need something that hits zero. Well, zero is something that hits zero. On the other hand, over here, you have H01, H13 plus H02, H23. That's not zero, but it is hit by H03, okay? And then, you, so, you, so, you've, so you've made all these five choices. And then you have to read down one diagonal and up the other, right? What you get is H1, H12 squared H03. That's the first term. You get H1, H12 H02 times H13. That's the second term. And then there's a third term that I didn't write because it's zero. Okay. So that's what you get. And then, so you get this expression. And then you, I'm, I just factored out an H12 because it factored out. And then I got this other expression here. And that thing, that's, th this is an expression that shows up a lot. This linear combination of these, of these of, uh, that's, that you see right here in parentheses comes up and it has, because it comes up so frequently, it actually has a name. It's called H zero of one. Why it's called that? Well, you have to go back to May's thesis to see why it's called that, but let's just take it at its name. This, this, for this expression, shorthand for that expression because it arises so frequently, okay? And then what you get, is something that's called C0 in an Adams chart. If we pull up an Adams chart, uh, and maybe we'll do that in a minute, we'll see, you can see an element C0. And this is a complete computation of this, this fourfold massy product equals C0. Okay, what we did was we did the computation with the May D1. We got a massy product in H of E1. And then we used the May convergence theorem to imply that there's a corresponding massy product in X. Okay, so this is the best way of computing massy product, most effective way of computing massy products by hand in X. You can't get all massy products in X this way. Okay, the computer can give you all the massy products in X, but many of the interesting massy products can be done using some May difference. Not always the May D1. Sometimes you use higher differentials. Okay, so this is just sort of to illustrate to you how it goes. Okay, so you can use the May differentials in order to compute massy products. Okay, and then the um, then on the other hand, you can do things the other way. Also, you can use uh, massy products to deduce May differentials, and that's what I want to talk about here in this in this example. And this will be the last example for today. What I've drawn here is a little bit of the May E two page. Okay, the May E1 page has all these, it's a, this polynomial thing and you compute, the, um, you compute D1 and you compute the homology uh, of E1, you get E2 and it looks like this. There's the identity and there's the tower of H0, H01 multiples. There are the H12 multiples. There's H23 and so forth, okay? And then you get this element that I've called B02 here. And I guess I didn't define that. But B02 in this picture is H02 squared. H02 squared 
is a cycle and it survives to the E2 page. And that's the degree right there, B02. Okay? And you might ask whether B02 supports a D2 differential. Okay? Well, the, the May differentials in this, in this Adams gradient, they go up, um, up one and to the left one. Okay? So there are possible elements for the value of the differential on B02 are sitting right here. And there's two dots, which really means there's a, you know, a vector space of order four. There are really four elements. One is zero and three non-zero elements. There's the left dot, the right dot, and then the sum of them. Okay? And you could ask whether or not there's a differential there. Okay, so here's a way of deducing this May differential from Massey products. Okay, let's start with the expression H12 cubed. Okay, and we'll write it as H12 times H12 squared. And then that's H12 times this bracket that we used Adams' theorem that's up there at the top of the screen to compute H12 squared. Okay. So we rewrote it as a bracket. Now I put an exclamation point on this because this is the key step. This is where the magic happens. You shuffle the bracket, you move the brackets. We, we talked about this general relation for Massey products. You shuffle it to the bracket of H12, H01, H12 with H0 and then just multiply by H01 on the right side. And then you use Adams' theorem again. That's this one. And that's H01, H23 times this H01 on the end. That's just that one, which then is H01, H23. Okay. So what we said, what we what we we used Massey products to deduce, there must be a relation in X. X must have the relation that H12 cubed must equal H01 squared H23. That must be the case. Okay. And what that means is that these two dots must be equal. In other words, there must be some differential that hits them, that hits their sum to make them equal in the following page. There has to be a differential to create that relation. And then you look, and the only possibility is that D2 of B02 must hit that sum, okay? That's a complete compute, using Massey products, that's a computation of, May, of this May D2, okay? And then from there, you can go further. Once you know this differential, then you can use the Leibniz rule to get that differential, that's what I've written down here in step three, I've got that differential, but then the Leibniz rule again implies that that has to be a differential. And now you've got this D2 of H01 is H01 H2 cubed, H, H2, H2 3 squared, sorry, H01 H2 3 squared. You get that differential also. So once you get that one, then a whole bunch of other ones kind of follow as well. Okay. Um, and, and, then, so that's, so, so that's sort of like deducing Massey products from May differentials. And now go back again. Now that we know these May differentials, now what we can do is we can use this May differential to, to get another bracket, another a Massey product for C0, okay? So C0, remember, is H12, H01, okay? And then you can make this Massey product H12, H01, H23 squared, because H01 is killing this second product. And so then when you do the Massey product computation, this is exactly what comes out. Okay, so there's this kind of like, you know, circular kind of, you know, you, 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 you compute differentials and you compute Massey products and you go back and forth constantly to keep track of, you know, what follows from what and you can kind of build your way up. All right, we're almost out of time, but really quickly, let me just pull up a chart here. Where, where is it here? This is the one I want, okay. Just so you can see itself, here's the C0 that we were talking about, okay? And one of the things, um, and let me write down the, uh, the brackets that we said. What did we say? We had for C0, we had bracket H1 squared, H0, H1, H2. And we also had that C0 was H1, H0, H2 squared. Okay, and you can you a good exercise, go through it, at least check the degrees of these things and just see how it kind of this all lines up and um, and makes sense. Okay, so um, 
what we didn't have a chance to talk about today is that you know these Massey products are actually telling you about total brackets, about the actual the homotopical structure in stable homotopy groups, and uh, and that and that's good to know. That's why we kind of you know care about all this stuff. But even if you didn't care about this stuff for the total brackets, you could care about it because you get the made differentials that way. That's the way to study X is to keep track of the Massey product information as you go as you compute. Okay, and I'll stop for today. Okay, uh, first of all, let's thank them for the great talk. You can unmute yourself or use the reactions. Thank you, Professor Isaacson. Okay, now we will open up for questions, if there are any. Yeah, I have a quick question. So uh, in the talk, you mentioned that the main special sequence the E1 page can be thought as a, a like universal uh, infinite Macy product has contains zero. Can, can you say a little bit more like about this? Uh, yeah, so let me go back here and pull up the slide where we were talking about it here. Okay, so, um, so I guess what let, let me just say this. This is sort of more restrict. I mean, there's this question about it being universal, but let's sort of, let's leave aside that universal thing for a second. Let me just point out that the um, that the homology of the May E1 page has arbitrarily long, well-defined Massey products. Hmm. Okay, so for example, there is that is a well-defined threefold massy product in E2 because these pairwise products are zero in, in the homology of E1 in E2. Okay. So there are, that is a well-defined threefold massy product. And that is a well-defined threefold massy product. And that is a well-defined threefold massy product, and so on forever. If you take those H's across the top, mm -hmm. take any three in a row, and you get a well-defined massy product in the May E2 page. Now, what value do you get? For those massy products, well, because of these guys, these guys are all hitting exactly what would be in that massy product. This massy product contains some, you know, linear combination, and H03 is hitting that exact linear combination. So therefore, this threefold contains zero because of that, and this threefold contains zero because of that. And this threefold contains zero because of that. Okay, so now all of these threefolds contain zero. That means that the fourfolds are well defined. So they have, there you have all these fourfolds that are well defined. Okay, what's in that fourfold? Well, there's some linear combination, but that is hits that that thing and makes it zero. So this contains zero because of this. This. This contains zero because of this, and so forth. So all of these fourfold massy products are also zero. Therefore, the fivefold massy products are well defined. But the fivefold massy products contain zero because of that element, and so on and so forth. And this goes forever, right? There are 18 fold massy products, they all contain zero. So there are 19 fold massy products, they also all contain zero. So there are 20 fold massy products. And so on and so forth. And you can, and the universality, as you can see, like the, the spectral sequence, the, the generators are built precisely to do this. If you want, you you want this to contain zero, and so you have to add that generator in order that 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 generator makes it zero, it makes it the next stage well defined. And you can sort of, it's sort of minimal that way. You can sort of see that that um, exactly. In one of the exercises, I've asked you to sort of think about this question. And it's, you know, it would be, it, it's, you know, in this more restricted case where there's just a threefold Massey product to worry about and think it through, see if you can try to write down um, kind of some kind of universal formulation about what this, um, about what this particular, what this particular example is in terms of threefold Massey products. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Um, could I ask a question? Sure. Um, can the higher massy products be used to compute made differentials? Or is that 
yes theory, like yes in theory and in practice like you know what you know what you do is you know you're looking for a reason why a made differential you know uh, looking for a proof of a made differential and the first thing you do is you look at the prime at the multiplicative structure for and that's what we did here if we know this one then the primary structure gives us this one and the primary structure then gives us this one so you can deduce this differential from this differential just looking at the ordinary ring structure and if you can't find a proof using the ordinary ring structure, then you start to play around with threefold Massey products. And maybe there are some threefold Massey products that you can shuffle around in order to deduce. And that's what we did here is we shuffled, we messed around with threefold Massey products. We produced a relation and we deduced a differential. And maybe you can't, and sometimes uh, you can't find a th an argument using threefold Massey products. So now you're starting to get desperate. And you maybe you try to look at some fourfold massive products and fiddle with them. And if you're lucky, you know, and you're careful and you're double check or triple check your indeterminacies and you don't make any mistakes, then maybe you can deduce a made differential by by uh, you by producing some relation that follows from a fourfold massive product. Absolutely, in 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 practice, that in theory that happens, and in practice, if you go far enough, eventually that happens. Um, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, I have I think like like once I used a fivefold massive product for this kind of argument, but like but not commonly. And it's and you know I would consider whatever whatever conclusion I drew from that I would consider to be tentative because there's just so many places where you can make a mistake and miss an indeterminacy or miss miss some subtlety with a massive product. Uh, but so so well, yes, in theory, but in practice, it doesn't it it, it doesn't really go beyond fourfold brackets. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, so are there more questions? Uh, yeah, so there is a one in the chat. So the oh. basic product I saw before has sign change, which does not exist here. So the change means what? Ah, uh, okay, great. Good question. So um, if you are going to work, so first of all, I'm always working in over F2. I'm always working in characteristic two. So for me, minus one equals plus one. And therefore I don't have to write down any minus signs. However, if you're working over an odd prime or you're working in characteristic zero, then you definitely do have to put minus signs in certain places in order to make things work. Okay. You, um, and uh, I don't even remember where they go because I always, because in practice, I'm always working at two. And so it never arises, but, uh, but yes, I, you know, I'm being lazy and ignoring by working at two. I don't, then I don't have to worry about, think about the minus signs. Okay, great. So let's send sex done again for the great talk. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm, I will be at that problem session on Tuesday, uh, an hour in advance. If people wanna come and talk about the problems or look at solutions, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, and if not then, then I'll see you guys um, on next Tuesday for the third talk. <laughs>